my talk is titled The Seven Freebies for Farmers. And some of this may be a little bit familiar to you. Hey, David, why don't you go ahead and dim the lights just a little bit to make the uh, screen show up a little bit better. But I entitled this Seven Freebies of Farmers. It's going to be really kind of a base introduction. I feel like I'm the opening act for the Rolling Stones or something here. So I'm just going to lay some groundwork uh, for a lot of the information that I think Dr. Jones is going to share. Uh, and then she can really build on this and get into a lot more of the details. So just a little quiz to get you started. If you want to get the attention of an animal, what do you do? Well, you can use something like this. Anybody know what that is? Yeah, that's a duck call, and they make calls for all sorts of animals. So if you want to get their attention, you, you know, make a sound like that animal. Try to bring them in. What if you want to get the attention of a soldier? You can get a bugler, okay, because there's certain bugle calls that will alert the soldiers to different things. If you want to get the attention of a child, well, they send in the ice cream truck, right? <laughs> That'll get their attention. What if you want to get the attention of a farmer? What do you do for that? Is there a call for that? <laughs> Why, yes, there is a call. This is the call of the farmer. Zach knows all about this. You just say, we've got an auction coming up, right? <laughs> That'll draw them in. <clears throat> but really, the call to the farmer is, hey, we've got free stuff. There's freebies here. And if you don't believe it, look around the room and see how many people actually paid for the hat that they're wearing. <laughs> Everybody likes freebies. Everybody likes free stuff. And as farmers, we're so blessed because we have so many free things at our disposal. And I'm not just talking about seed corn company caps and you know, trips to you know, the Caribbean if you buy a whole bunch of corn seed. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the free things that God has given us through his wonderful creation that are at our disposal as farmers. And that's what I want to talk about here this morning to kind of set the stage, is there's seven really crucial free things that for farmers if we would only take advantage of them. And, and kind of the subtitle of this is, Are You Getting Your Share? Because if you're not getting your share of these free things, it's only your fault, nobody else's fault. Because the thing, the seven things that I'm going to talk about, just because Lauren is getting a bunch, doesn't take away from my access to it. We each have equal access to it, and these things are virtually unlimited. So we're going to go through these. It's going to kind of set the stage for the rest of the day, uh, and then we'll let Christine dive into the, to the really high-end technical stuff. So number one, the number one free thing that we have access to is solar energy, sunlight. It is free. It is limitless, and plants, I say it's the best way to capture, store, and convert it, but, but really it's almost the only way to really take advantage of that. Now you could argue, you know, solar panels and things like that, but from a farmer standpoint, solar energy is limitless and free, and it's the energy that drives our system. It's the energy that drives our system, and it's so important that you take advantage of that solar energy. And, and oftentimes as farmers, we don't even think about it. We don't think about what we're doing. You know, as we're planting those corn seeds, as we're planting those soybean seeds, you know, out pop these cool little solar collectors called leaves. And photosynthesis right here, CO2 plus H2O with the power of the sunlight and the chlorophyll in these plants it creates C6H12O6, which is glucose. It's a simple carbohydrate sugar. And oxygen is a byproduct. We'll talk about oxygen later, but that's important for anybody who wants to breathe. It's a great little byproduct. And so this formula, you learned it in elementary school, you, you, you studied it in high school, the most important chemical formula in the world because it's the basis of our life. And it's the sunlight energy that powers the whole thing and really, as farmers, we're not really growing corn, we're not really growing beans or wheat or anything else. We're really just capturing solar energy and turning it into something of value. We're solar farmers. Solar farmers. Now, I know there's, in some of your areas, there are a lot of solar farms coming in, but that's much different than being solar farmers. We're capturing the power of the sun, and if you don't capture it, it's just simply wasted. And so what we need to do is we need to think about what we're growing, 
how we're growing it, the sequence that we're growing it in, and figure out how to be more efficient at capturing it. So if you're in a corn-soybean rotation, which many people in our area right in here, and I know we got people from all across the country and even across the world, but around here, corn-soybeans rule the day. Okay, In a corn-soybean rotation, and there's nothing wrong with those crops, but if that's all you're doing, you're capturing less than 50% of the sunlight that's hitting the ground. And so that's kind of wasteful. If you were only 50% efficient at anything else, you would think that's kind of wasteful. Well, maybe fertilizer, that's maybe not that much better, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. But you have to have something growing there more often if you're going to take advantage of all the sunlight that God is sending you on the acres that you have. So, corn, soybeans, put a cover crop in there. Graze the cover crop. We saw that yesterday. We saw cover crops planted after soybeans and, and, and some after corn in those different plots. And then we're planting right back into it. So we're capturing the maximum amount of solar energy because we're putting those cover crops and I talked yesterday about why rye is such an awesome cover crop because it can be planted so late and it will germinate in 34 degree soils and at 38 degrees in sunshine, it's photosynthesizing. Nothing else does that. And so even on those cold winter days when the sun is shining, that rye plant is doing a little bit. It's, it's cranking out a little bit of photosynthesis. And so we need to maximize that effort. And we need to convert as much of that sunlight as possible. Now, maybe some of you in here are wheat farmers or have wheat as part of your rotation, hopefully. You know, wheat is a great crop because it allows us to do lots of different things after it. Now, unfortunately, what many people do after wheat is spray it, spray it, spray it, keep the weeds down, or they till it, or hopefully nobody in here does this, they burn the stubble. Okay, but we, we've all seen that down in Kansas, you down in your area, that's not uncommon. At least it used to be, and it's probably some people will still do it. So with wheat, we have so many opportunities to do these wonderful, diverse 10, 12, 15-way cover crop mixes that we can all get really excited about because they have all this huge diversity. And to me, that's one of the most important reasons that you would do. And it doesn't have to be weed. It could be, you could be growing rye for, for cover crop. You could be growing peas uh, for the human consumption market. It's something that's harvested in the summertime that allows this other type of cover crop. Because now we're capturing the maximum amount of solar energy. When you harvest wheat July 1st, that's pretty close to the longest days of the year. And then all that fallow period you're wasting the maximum amount of sunshine days that there is. And so just be thinking about the rotation that you have and where can you put these cover crops into the rotation to capture that solar energy. Because when you have a field that looks like this, and, and this, this could represent wheat stubble, it could represent corn stalks, it could represent a soybean field, but when you have a field like that and nothing is growing and the weather conditions allow something to grow, then it's a missed opportunity. You're wasting that solar energy. You're wasting the opportunity to turn that sunlight into something of value, something that can help build your soil, something that can help grow your livestock, something that can feed your soil biology. It's a missed opportunity. Now, I know that some of you are from much drier climates. And sometimes, even here, you know, it's, it's quite dry. And so there are things that you have to consider, you know, that's the context of the, the operation that you're in. In a drier environment, you have to, the timing of this is really important. You can't terminate one crop and plant your next one like we were doing under the pivot. We don't typically do what you saw yesterday. We don't typically do that on a lot of our dry land acres because we don't feel like we can support that on the rainfall that we get year in and year out. So you have to kind of tailor make these solutions to the context of your environment. All right, number two. So number one, if solar energy is free and plants are the best way to capture it. Number two, carbon is not a problem. Carbon is not a problem. Now, that's probably something you don't hear very often in the news. Okay, I think carbon needs a new press agent because it's gotten a lot of bad press and it's the whipping boy for everybody from you know, this group to that group, they blame carbon. Carbon is easy to blame. It's relatively easy to measure. 
And it certainly has increased in, in the atmosphere. But it's not the problem. We'll talk about that. Oh, I'm not smart enough to know what the problem is. Maybe Christine can, can enlighten us on what the problem is. The problem is, is it's not in the soil anymore. That's the problem. But carbon is free food for both plants and biology. And if you're going to feed your plants and feed your biology, and if you're a farmer and you're trying to grow something, the sunlight is the energy. It's not the food. It's the energy. The food is the carbon. And again, that's free. That's free. And so what we need to do is, again, as we think about photosynthesis, you know, the first part of photosynthesis is taking CO2, and that is partially coming from the atmosphere. And I say partially coming from the atmosphere because, you know, that's where a lot of it is held. And, and we'll, we'll, you know, there's about four one-hundredths of one percent. So it's in very low concentrations. But oftentimes, a limiting factor in us growing better and bigger and more productive crops is we don't have enough carbon. Those plants can't pull enough out of the atmosphere. So when we have a system that's developed and we have decomposing residue, so that field that you saw that Brian had planted, you know, 10 days ago, that corn was just coming up, you know, there's all that rye residue out there. Well, when that corn, you know, gets knee high and it starts to canopy, that rye is going to start breaking down. And as that residue breaks down, guess what one of the byproducts of break, residue breakdown is? It's carbon dioxide. And the concentration of that CO2 will be a higher concentration below the leaves as it will be above the leaves. And guess where God put the stomata of a plant when he designed them? It's underneath the leaf. And so we can capture that CO2 from my residue decomposition. I can capture it before it ever gets to the atmosphere. And, and you know, it's a very common practice in greenhouses. You pump extra CO2 into the greenhouse because it always increases production. And so carbon is not a problem. We just got to get it in the right place at the right time. And so here's how it works. Uh, carbon is uh, the food. So the plants are producing carbon right here through photosynthesis. This is that glucose molecule. And the plant has an amazing ability to turn this into many, many different compounds. It does not stay as glucose, but it is paid out through these liquid root exudates. And I got a cool picture I'm going to show you here in a little bit. It's leaked out as much as 50% of the carbon that a plant produces through photosynthesis. It's not used by the plant to, to grow roots, to grow new leaves, to flower, to put on seeds. As much as half of what it can produce through photosynthesis is leaked out through the root system. And the, the biology, all of these critters here, they're, they're consuming it. It's their food source. And so they're taking it in. And then in exchange, they are having to deliver something back to that plant. <coughs> because plants are very smart. And if they're not getting a return on their investment, they're going to stop putting as much of that carbon out. So if you want, and so it's kind of a situation where the poor soils get poorer because that plant can sense if there's biology out there. And if there's no biology, it's not going to put as much carbon into the soil. So the, the bad soils get worse and the good soils get better because where you do have a lot of biology, the plant says, oh, I've got workers here. They just need to be fed and so it pumps massive amounts of carbon into the soil to feed the biology and, and produce and provide all these services, sourcing nutrients, delivering nutrients, protecting the plant. All of these things is what makes the soil a living system, as, as uh, Christine is going to talk about later today. So carbon is not a problem, and if somebody is telling you there's way too much carbon, just tell them, well... It's just in the wrong place, and the solution is pretty simple. We just need to put it back where it belongs, and, and that's into the soil. And, 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 and it's, it, it's a cycle. Carbon is a cycle. So here's some pictures from our friend Jimmy Emmons from Oklahoma, and, and these are really cool pictures, but I understand uh, Jimmy, Jimmy told me on a uh, conversation we had earlier because uh, Dr. Jones was down in Oklahoma earlier, and he said, I've... I've my pictures aren't as good as what Dr. Jones is going to share. So I'm going to share these, but you're going to see some other ones uh, in Christine's presentation as well. So this is Jimmy Emmons, farmer in Oklahoma. Uh, he planted a cover crop of cereal rye, uh, um, and the rye was probably 10 inches tall. They had a field day. He was out there digging around, and these are some pictures that he took. So first of all, look at all the great 
uh, soil aggregation on the roots. It tells you he's got a very active, biologically active system uh, that's forming all those glues and making that soil cling to the roots. And as he, he took his iPhone and he has a little magnifier on it called the ProScope, and he was uh, looking at these things more closely, and he saw this picture on the right. And what this is, uh, and, and again, uh, this, this is just with his iPhone and a magnifier. This is kind of a hole right here. You can see this soil around it. That, that's a worm burrow. So as he dug up the soil and he kind of broke it apart, it exposed a, a worm burrow. And he saw this cereal rye root from this cover crop, from, you know, not necessarily this plant, but from that same field. It was growing sideways through this worm burrow. And so these root hairs is what you see, these little root hairs coming out. Those weren't actually growing in the soil, so they're incredibly well preserved. And he was able to see that, and as he got to looking at it, he's like, there's something kind of interesting. And he kind of noticed, you know, this right kind of this right in here. So he upped his magnification, and he got this picture here, the same picture on the left. But this picture on the right, look at all of those little liquid droplets on that. Now that's the liquid carbon, the liquid root exudates that are being pumped out by that cover crop that's only 10 to 12 inches tall. Okay, so it's not like it's four foot tall rye, but it's actively growing, it's actively photosynthesizing. And, and think about that being the diameter of a worm burrow. So what, eighth of an inch at the most? Look at how many droplets of carbon are being pumped into the soil in that tiny little area. And then you multiply, you know, a cereal rye root has, you know, a cereal rye has massive amounts of roots in one plant. And then you have a million plants per acre. You start doing the math, and those are some crazy big numbers of how much carbon is being put into the soil. And I have it on good authority that this carbon is 30 to 50 times more effective at becoming soil organic matter than what the actual rye plant that's going to decompose above the ground is going to be. And so this is the basis of you know, feeding the system, building the soil, but this is why carbon is not a problem. It's a food source for all of those organisms. All right, number three. We've got sunlight free. We've got the carbon that's free. Number three, nitrogen is free and abundant. And when I say that, now this crowd, you understand that, but if you would say this to a group of conventional farmers, they would want to stand up and fight you because they'd say, well, you want to see my bill for nitrogen? How can you tell me that's free? Well, they're not wrong. They spent, we spent, as a industry, we spend almost five billion dollars a year and that's just in the u.s that's just the u.s that's not the rest of the world we spend five billion dollars a year putting nitrogen fertilizer on our crops that's a huge amount of money oftentimes one of the biggest expenses that people have five billion dollars how can i say it's free well when you look at the makeup of our atmosphere so this is a pie chart pie chart adds up to hundred percent We've got CO2 right here, carbon dioxide, four one-hundredths of one percent. So that plant is pulling, you know, when it's pulling the atmosphere in, it's pulling in four one-hundredths. It's not four percent. It's not four-tenths of a percent. Four one-hundredths of a percent. And, and if you want to have a little bit of fun when somebody is talking about, well, carbon is ruining our lives and carbon is going to destroy the world, ask them how much carbon is in the atmosphere. They probably won't know. They're going to say, oh, it's a way too, oh, it's just lots and lots and lots. Four one-hundredths of one percent. Nitrogen, 78 percent of our atmosphere is nitrogen. So above every acre of crop ground, there are 30,000 tons of nitrogen. Just sitting there, just in the atmosphere, waiting to be taken. 30,000 tons of nitrogen. Now, here's the problem. The nitrogen in the atmosphere is in the dinitrogen, so it's two nitrogen molecules bonded to each other with triple covalent bonds. So it's N2. It's, it's literally inert because it's tied so tightly to each other, they really aren't interested in interacting with anybody else. And so that's why, and so there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is 
You can take a breath, you're taking in 78% nitrogen, it does absolutely nothing to you. But if you've ever had a whiff of anhydrous or other forms of ammonia, you know what that can do. And we all know people that have either been killed or seriously injured from those types of accidents. It can be very destructive to the human body, but not this. The atmospheric nitrogen is N2, so it's completely inert to people. It's also completely inert to plants. Plants are taking in all that nitrogen when, when the stomata open up. They're bringing in the atmosphere. They're stripping out the carbon molecules. They're bringing in all that nitrogen. But the plant can do absolutely nothing with it. Just like our bodies can do nothing with that nitrogen, which is a good thing. It just has to uh, exhale it right back out. And so what has to happen is if we're going to make this into a form that plants can actually use, this bond right here has to be broken. You have to break this triple bond, and it takes a lot of energy. And you have to combine it with hydrogen and oxygen and other things and put it into forms of nitrogen that the plant can now use. And so we, in our wisdom, mankind, we can do this, but it's incredibly expensive and energy-intensive, and so we have these huge nitrogen factories. They, this concept kind of got started during World War II, they really kind of perfected, or during World War I, they perfected it in World War II, but they had no interest in making fertilizer for farmers during that time. They were making nitrogen to make bombs. And, and that's how the nitrogen, that's how the fertilizer industry really got started, was making bombs because when you unlock those nitrogen molecules, there's a huge amount of energy potential in that. And some of you in here are old enough to remember I think it's probably 27, 28 years ago now, the Oklahoma City bombings, Timothy McVeigh. He blew up that, it's like a seven or eight story concrete federal building in Oklahoma City. What was his bomb? It was a truckload of ammonium nitrate. Yeah, and it blew up that entire building. So, nitrogen is free and abundant, but in order to get it into a form that plants can use, it takes huge amounts of expense. So when you're paying your bill for nitrogen, you should not consider it a fertility input. You should consider it an energy input because you're paying for the energy that it takes to make it available. But God in his wisdom has given us these tiny little critters that do the exact same thing that those big factories do. So rhizobia bacteria will form associations with these legumerates, and we saw that. We were digging up peas and faba beans and things out in the plots, and you could see those nodules forming. And some of you, I know, saw some that were pink, some of them that weren't pink. Uh, but the pink ones mean they're really actively converting that dinitrogen into plant-available forms of nitrogen. And so rhizobia are the, the engine that makes us work for legumes. So don't ever tell people, well, I'm growing soybeans, I don't have to put nitrogen on because they could make their own. They can't. Those plants can't do that. They can only support the biology that is doing that for them. And so that's, that's a big distinction. It's a big distinction because apart from the biology, that soybean plant would not be able to get any of that nitrogen out of the atmosphere. So rhizobia, uh, bacteria, incredibly powerful, incredibly important. But it's not the only things that's out there. There are other things as well. These free-living diazotrophs like azosporillum, zodobacter, bacillus, cyanobacteria. There's different types of algae. There's other types of leaf endophytes. We're discovering, I say we, well, like I have anything to do with it, but, but the industry is discovering new organisms all the time that can be beneficial nitrogen fixers for our plants if we create the right environment for them, uh, for the plants to host them. And so these are free-living, they're mostly single-celled organisms, and so you might, you might look at this slide and say, well, Keith, that's great news, I'm just going to go dump a whole bucket load of azosporillum out on my corn, and, and never have to worry about nitrogen fertilizer again. Well, you know, not so fast, my friend, as, as uh, Lee Corso would say. So here's the deal. Rhizobia bacteria, that little nodule right here, this little nodule, that's made up of billions of rhizobia bacteria to, to create this, this whole nodule factory. Just think of that as a whole big factory, and they've got multiple shifts working the factory line, and that thing is producing... Lots of nitrogen. If you grow 70 bushel soybeans, then your soybean rhizobia, they have to crank out 350 to 400 pounds of nitrogen in about 60 days in order for that to happen. 
That's a huge amount of nitrogen. I mean, think about putting 400 pounds of nitrogen on your field, what that looks like. And these guys are producing it at the microscopic level, 400 pounds of nitrogen in 60 days. That's incredibly powerful, incredibly efficient. But it's because they're, they're working as a group. They're working in that, that nodule colony. These things are more single-celled operators. You know, they're, they're like the mom-and-pop shop instead of, you know, the huge factory. They can't produce nearly as much. So you're looking at probably 30 to 50 pounds of nitrogen per year out of these types of organisms. So is that going to be enough to grow a 250 bushel corn crop? Well, not by itself, but it's part of the solution. But how far does 30 to 50 units of nitrogen go to help a cover crop or a forage crop? Or in a system where you're not heavily extractive and you're hauling all the nitrogen away in the form of a crop, in a system where that nitrogen is continually cycling, this often is enough to make the system work. And that's how these soils were built, you know, in this area and across much of the world. You know, thousands of years of these crops growing. And, and a lot of these, these uh, native uh, perennial uh, grasslands did not have huge amounts of legumes. So it wasn't just rhizobia that were doing it. It was these things that were out there doing a lot of the work and the heavy lifting as well. So a couple of resources that I would encourage you if you want to dive into this on a much deeper level. Uh, we did a couple of webinars, uh, one with Dr. James White. You definitely want to watch that if you haven't seen Dr. White talk about rhizophagy. And he talked extensively in there about endophytes that can live in the leaves, uh, in, uh, endophytes in the soil, and how the plant roots are actually taking those up and stripping off the cell walls and converting the nitrogen out of these bacteria. It's a fascinating topic. Uh, so that's on our YouTube channel. You can watch that. And then I referenced this yesterday as well, the nitrogen solution from Dr. Jones here. Uh, three years ago, we did this. It's been viewed 71,000 times. I think this is our most popular uh, video. It, and, and I'm very thankful that something finally passed the video of me running the air seeder completely off the road. That used to be our most popular video. So I'm happy to report that there's something actually educational and not just embarrassing. That is now our most popular video. So if you haven't seen that, please watch, that, not, not the air seeder one, this one. <laughs> Go to our YouTube channel and search for that. It's a, it's a fascinating webinar. It says part three of four. Uh, it, there's, Christine did four webinars. So this one is all about nitrogen. There's one that's all about phosphorus. And then there's a couple of other ones as well. So uh, she, she'll probably share some of this information, but you can take a deep dive on that yourself. All right, number four, oxygen. Oxygen is free and it's available. And we oftentimes don't think about oxygen as something that we need in our cropping system, but it is very important because all of those living organisms, all of those bacteria, all the fungi, all of the nematodes, all these things, they need oxygen and you have to have oxygen for your roots to grow. Roots will never grow deeper than where you have oxygen in your soil. And that's why compaction, compaction hurts you in several ways. It really reduces your infiltration, but it also is really important because when it limits how far that oxygen can get down into the soil, your roots will never go deeper than that. And so you have to be able to exchange the CO2 that is part of the byproduct of these plants growing that has to get exchanged with oxygen. And we oftentimes don't think of that. Sometimes our limiting factor is not moisture, it's not carbon. Sometimes the limiting factor is oxygen. And it's simply because you can't get oxygen down far enough into your soil because you have something that looks like this where there's no pore spaces or we brought some of these soil cores back. I mean, just think about you know, how much pore space is in this parent material stuff down here. Not very darn much. And so how much oxygen can get down through that? Not very darn much. And I can't push roots down unless there's oxygen there. Now, there are some tiny roots down here because before this hillside got cut, there was a short grass perennial out there. So there are some channels going down, but not very many. And it's, it's not going to be a very productive piece of soil. So whenever you have compaction, that's one of the things that really hurts you it's not just lack of water infiltration, but it's lack of oxygen into the soil. 
So as farmers, we have to be thinking about that. We have to think about how can we drive that oxygen down deeper because then the roots can go deeper. Now I have a bigger place to hold moisture, uh, a bigger uh, factory to grow my plants. Number five, soils are rich in minerals and plant nutrients. When you buy a piece of ground, you are buying all the minerals and all the nutrients that are in that soil. And there's a lot. You know, soil is you know, 46 to 50% minerals. And those minerals are made, you know, the, the composition of that, many of these things are what plants need to grow. So good soil, you know, 46%, 4% organic matter, approximations, 25% air, 25% water. The minerals and the, the nutrients that your plants need to grow most likely are in your soils. They are just locked up in a form that plants can't get. Just like God never created plants to pull the 30,000 tons of nitrogen out of the atmosphere, he didn't create them to pull the nutrients directly out of that mineral portion of the soil as well. And so the only way that you can get those, and, and all of these things, you know, the phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, it's all, it's all in there. But the way that you get them is you have to pull them out through the biology. And so I love this article uh, many of you may have seen me share this one before, but this is from Scientific American. Mycorrhiza fungi run the largest mining operation in the world. I think that's just such an ironic title because when we think of a mining operation, we think of this giant equipment, you know, payloaders that have tires as big as your house, and, and you've seen all those pictures. But they're saying the largest mining operation in the world happens at such a microscopic level that if you don't have a really good microscope, you're not even going to see it happening. And the juxtaposition of the scale of that is just almost hard to imagine, but it's because it's happening across so many millions and millions of acres across the world. And So here's, here's how it works. Uh, this picture over here, this is a tiny piece of feldspar, highly magnified. Just think of it, you know, this is a soil particle, a soil mineral, like a little piece of sand. And you see these channels, these, these brown tunnels in here, those are actually hollowed out spaces. Those are mine shafts, if you will, microscopic mine shafts that the mycorrhiza fungi, they, they can create the right chemicals uh, and they can cultivate the right bacteria that can actually dissolve solid rock. And so they will bo chemically bore into these things, pull out the nutrients that the plant needs and deliver it back to the plant and as cool as that is, I mean, that's a superpower to be able to dissolve solid rock mineral and turn it into plant nutrients. They can't eat that. That's not their food source. They have to have carbon in order to do that. And so this is what it looks like. Uh, and again, Christine will likely have, uh, you know, more and better pictures of this as well. But here, this is a plant root. And the, this is called arbuscular mycorrhiza fungi. So these little black or brownish things they're actually, part of that is growing inside the plant root. So it's a very efficient system because they don't, the, the, the plant here doesn't actually have to leak the carbon out into the soil. It can feed these things directly from the root, inside the root. And then all those little hairs going out, uh, that's the mycorrhiza hyphae going out into the soil. That's what goes out and that's what's creating, making these tunnels and it's bringing those nutrients. It can even, in dry times, it can even bring moisture from the soil that plant roots could never get, mycorrhiza can transport that moisture back to the plant as long as the plant is willing to feed it. Okay, it's just like a lot of people. You know, if you're if you're desperate for work, you'll work for food, and that's what these guys are doing. They're working for food. You feed me, I'll do these different services for you. So it's a wonderful system, and when we have highly colonized plants and we have mycorrhiza in the soil, the, the need for us to put on a lot of these non-nitrogen fertility products, because nitrogen is not naturally part of the soil, it's part of the atmosphere. Now we have nitrogen in the soil, but it came from the atmosphere. But these other minerals are part of our soil, and the way that we can get them out is through this mycorrhiza. Now, when I'm, when I'm done here, uh, we're going to, instead of doing question and answer time, we've got some bonus content that wasn't even advertised, uh, but Willie Pretorius over here with Ward Labs is going to share a few slides because they're developing, he in, in conjunction with Ward Labs is developing a new test to more easily test not only for mycorrhiza in your soil, 
but also to test your plants to see if they're actually colonizing the mycorrhiza that are in the soil. Because one of the big concerns with all of these new corn varieties, wheat varieties, soybean varieties, is have they been bred for so long in such an environment that they've lost their ability to colonize with the mycorrhiza? doesn't do you any good to have mycorrhiza in your soil if you're planting a plant that won't associate with it. So the test will look at both of those. So Willie will come up in a little bit and talk a little bit more about that. Okay, number six. So we've got solar energy, we've got carbon, we've got nitrogen, we've got oxygen, we've got soil, and we've got water. Precipitation, uh, it's given to all. You know, the Bible tells us that, you know, the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. So when you're in a drought, stop blaming your neighbor's sinful lifestyle for being in a drought because that's not, you know, because he's probably doing the same thing with you. But the water is given to us all. Now, do we always have enough of it? No. Do we sometimes have too much of it? Yes. So we can't really control how often and when it rains or snows or hails or any of that. So when you look at the water cycle, there's not a lot of this that we can control. But there is some of it that we can control, and it's a really important part. We can control this part right here, this part of the water cycle. How much of what is falling through precipitation, how much of that is getting into your soil through infiltration, that's up to you. That's completely on you. And if you have poor infiltration, that's your fault. It's the fault of the system of how you're farming, uh, and, and we could go into all of the details. And you, know, and you saw in some of our fields out there, we don't have as good of infiltration as we'd like. And some of that's because you know, we ran heavy equipment when it was a little wetter than it should have been. You know, some of it was you know, past tillage sins when you know, it was some gravity irrigation. There, there's a whole number of things that can hurt that. And, and that's okay, you just have to understand it and then figure out how can I make it better? How can I improve it? How can I help reduce some of that compaction and increase my infiltration? So that's the part of the water cycle that you can control. And when you can control it, it's a huge thing. Many of you have seen these pictures. This, uh, this is a picture that Russ Jackson took. Uh, Russ is a customer of ours. He grows uh, cereal rye for us. If you've bought Elbon cereal rye from us, there's a chance that it was grown right here on this field. Russ Jackson uh, down at Mountain View, Oklahoma. He took this picture a few years ago. They'd been in a pretty bad drought, and they got this big 5.3-inch rain event. And isn't that how it happens a lot of times? You're in a drought, and then you, know, you get two months' worth of rain you know, in a couple of hours. And so he took this picture... Uh, because it's just it's a stunning comparison between two different systems. So over here, his neighbor, his management, conventional tillage, he only grew small grains, no cover crops, no grazing. And, and it was, uh, the, the NRCS had been out just uh, earlier that same summer, and they had taken, they had done the infiltration tests, just like we had done yesterday. <coughs> Excuse me. They had done these tests on these two fields, so they knew exactly what the infiltration was. So his neighbor, 0.6 inches an hour. So that guy got 16,507 gallons of water stored from that rainfall event. Now that sounds like a lot. Six, would you like 16,000 gallons of water per acre? Yes, please. I'll take that. But when you compare it with what Russ's system, no-till crop rotation, he uses cover crops, plant grazing management, his infiltration was six inches an hour. So even if this 5.3 inches came in an hour, and it didn't come quite that fast, but it did come fairly fast, he got it all. He got it all. He got 143,906 gallons of water into the ground. And because of the way he's farming, his organic matter levels were much higher than his neighbor, so he could store it and he could hold it. Because for every percent of organic matter that you can increase, and, and that's a big thing to increase a percent of organic matter, but when you can, you can store an additional acre inch of water. And that's a pretty big deal. So 27,000 gallons in an acre inch. So look at the difference. <coughs> Who's going to grow the better crops following you know, the next crop? 
Well, that's pretty easy to know. Russ is going to because he got so much more water. So, you know, when you get a rainfall event and people say, well, how much rain did you get? I got half an inch. I got 1,600s, whatever. The only answer should be, say it, all of it. I got all of it. And then people will go, well, what do you mean? And so then you can do your little soil health elevator speech when you say, I got all of it. So that's, uh, you know, infiltration is the part of the water. That rainfall is free, but if you can't infiltrate it, you can't store it, it's wasted. And so farm in such a way that you capture the maximum amount of moisture. And that's important because your plant needs it to grow, but photosynthesis will stop without water. See, there's only two things that go into photosynthesis, and that's one of them. Now, we're not going to run out of CO2, but there are times when we run out of water because of how we're managing our system. Now, you can be the best manager in the world, have the best soils in the world, <coughs> and if you're in an extended drought, things are just going to stop. Things are going to slow down. There's no two ways about that. But you have to manage in such a way that when the opportunities are there, you can capture the moisture and have it for your plant to be able to photosynthesize. And then number seven. Number seven, we've kind of been talking about it throughout. The soil biology makes the system bigger, faster, stronger, and more efficient. Soil biology drives the whole system. Soil biology is what's driving that nitrogen. Soil biology is what's freeing up those minerals and those nutrients and getting them into your plants. Soil biology is helping put the carbon where it needs to go because they're consuming those liquid carbon root exudates and they're turning that into organic matter. The soil biology makes the system so much better. Now, earthworms, you know, we were digging up earthworms yesterday. People were seeing those. Sergio, I heard Sergio talking this morning in his farm in Italy. Uh, he's got five times more earthworms than his neighbors do. And, and that's, that's a huge advantage. Huge advantage. You want better infiltration? Get earthworms. They'll take care of that job for you. You know, you have too much residue on your soil surface, have more earthworms. They'll take care of that as well. So earthworms are the one part of soil biology that we can actually see. These other things we have to do some other tests for. So sometimes people will say, well, what, what soil test should I run to see if I have biology? The first question I always ask is, do you have earthworms? And if the answer is no, then I just say, save your money. <laughs> that other stuff's not there anyway. But once you start seeing some earthworms starting to come back and you start to see their populations grow and they're active, now, yeah, hey, you can run a, you know, this PLFA, you can do some... DNA testing, you can do other things like that. And so another little added bonus content. See, this is like one of those DVDs you rent, and then it's got bonus content on it. So we have Dr. Laura Cavanaugh in the back of the room. She's also going to come up and talk about some DNA sequencing, DNA analysis, uh, some testing that she's working. She's with uh, AEA, Advancing EcoAg, and they're developing a DNA test to help farmers understand what you have in your soil. So she's going to talk a little bit about that as well. But the soil biology makes the system bigger, faster, stronger, and more efficient. And if you don't have it, you are really, really missing out on a lot of them. And so here's what I like to say about soil biology. You need them. Your system needs them. So sometimes you have to seed them. And by seeding them, that means you may have to put some biological starter out there. Um, you, know, so the, you know, there's companies in here selling biological products. Compost extracts, we can put that on the seed for you. There's, there's lots of good products out there. So sometimes you have to add that to help jumpstart the system. And it's not like your soil doesn't have anything out there, but adding some of these products can help accelerate you to the point there you want to get. So you need them. So you need to seed them, and then you have to feed them. Because it doesn't matter how much biology you have out there, if there is a lapse in the food chain, they're going to die off. They're going to go dormant. They're going to disappear. And so you have to keep them fed. And the only way that they can eat, if you don't want them eating all of your organic matter, is you have to have a living plant out there. You have to literally have green cover out there growing because those root exudates are, are what is feeding them. And so the biology is really important. 
So you need them, so you might have to seed them, but you absolutely have to feed them. Now, you might think that farmers should be the richest people in the world because look at all this free stuff we have, right? Obviously, we all know as farmers that it's not as easy as just saying, yeah, I'll take that, I'll take that, I'll take that. There's a huge amount of intricacy in making all these things work in your system. And so the way that you cash in on these freebies, it's, it's through soil health. And so I'm just going to real quickly, and, and I know this is preaching largely to the choir with the soil health principles, and I'm not going to go into any great depth on them, but I just want you to keep them in your mind as Dr. Jones comes up and talks later, that these are the basic principles that all of us, regardless of where we're at, whether we're farming in Nebraska or Arizona or Alabama or Italy or Brazil or wherever else you're from, these principles will work in your area. The practices that you use to implement them could be drastically different, and they will be drastically different. So number one, you've got to keep the soil covered. That is so important to keep the soil covered, keep it cool, protect the biology. If your soil erodes, if it washes away, if it blows away, it doesn't matter how good it was, it's gone. So you've got to keep the soil covered. Number two, you need to minimize the disturbance. Um, I was listening to Davis give the plot tour uh, yesterday, and when he came to the Harry Vet, she was talking about Jerry Laner's. This is Jerry Laner's picture right here. So this is Jerry's field. He was rolling down hairy vetch, a beautiful crop of hairy vetch, pulling his planter right through that. That's the ultimate in minimizing disturbance. And it's the ultimate because not only is he eliminating the physical disturbance of any tillage, he's organic, so he's eliminating the chemical disturbance as well. So don't just think of disturbance as tillage. It certainly is. That's a mechanical disturbance, but there's also a lot of chemical disturbance we do when we're spraying chemicals, we're putting synthetic fertilizers out there. And notice the principle isn't to eliminate. I mean, that would be great if we could, but it's to minimize. Because all of these things, tillage, fertilizers, chemicals, they're, they're tools, and you may need to use them at the appropriate time. But the thing with the tool is, if you're using it for the wrong purpose, or you're using it too often, or you're using the wrong tool, you're going to break something. You're going to break something, and it, it will likely be very expensive to do. So you need to use your tools appropriately and efficiently and effectively. So minimize disturbance, like Jerry was doing here. Uh, this is a picture of what that same field looked like. How would you like to have any cornfield look like this, let alone organic corn? Beautiful. Now, could he do this every year? No, he was not able to do this every year. But the years that he did, it was beautiful. And, and when it didn't work as well as this, it was largely a timing issue. Um, and we, you can ask questions about that later. But that's a beautiful field, and any of us would be proud to have that. Number three, maximize the diversity, particularly the biological diversity. Because the more of these organisms that we have, the better off that we're going to be. And so you need to have a system. You have to grow a diverse amount of plants if you want a diverse amount of biology out there. Number four, having living roots as often as possible. Uh, and that may mean interceding in between your corn crop. It might be some perennials in part of the system as that. But just think about your rotation and how can I have living roots out there as often as possible because that's what's feeding the biology. That's what's driving the system. And then number five, integrate properly managed livestock. You know, get livestock out on the ground as often as you can. This is a picture from a, one of our customers out west uh, using his pivot as a, as a mobile fence, and he's grazing, uh, grazing residue out there uh, using his pivot. And, and then, of course, number six, and I, and I, well, I guess I got a couple more. So this, this is a beautiful picture. This is on the front of our Soil Health Resource Guide right in front of you. Uh, this, this made the cover because it's such a great picture. It's an awesome-looking you know, black steer there with the Rocky Mountains as the background. This is from Mark King uh, out on the western slopes of the Rocky Mountains, you know, grazing a, a beautiful cover crop. So it was a close competition. Every year we kind of have a competition to see what the cover of this is going to be. So I ultimately had the last say. So I like this one because we have a lot of people raising cattle, but this one was a strong second place because... <laughs> How that person got that stupid pig to smile like that, I have no idea. 
but it's pretty darn good. So it's not on the cover, but it is in the book because it's a pretty awesome picture. So there are many ways to integrate livestock, not just with cattle, but I know there's people in here uh, running chickens. You know, I talked to a guy yesterday running, you know, 600 laying hens uh, through the alleyways of a pecan orchard. There's so many cool, in innovative, and creative ways to integrate livestock into the operation. Don't be afraid to try different things. And then, of course, the sixth principle, and maybe the most important, and I alluded to it, it's the context. These principles will work. You have to find the practices. And that's why it's so important that you connect with other people in here because you can really learn from the practices that they found that work. And it, and it might not be that those are going to work for you, but you might you, it will help generate creative ideas for yourself. So please utilize this time during the breaks, during lunch, Connect with the people uh, around you. Connect with people that you think you, know, you could either help or be helped by down the road and continue the learning long after uh, the conference is over. So that's the seven freebies uh, for so soil health. Uh, so thank you for your attention and patience, and I hope that sets the stage for Dr. Jones.